Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. So glad that you could join us today. Many of us uh, deal with medical errors, preventable medical errors. We say that everyone makes mistakes, but when it comes to healthcare professionals, those that we count on to, to uh, keep us healthy and those that we go to when we're well, for lack of a better term, broken, we set the, the bar kind of high, I'll say. Our guest in studio today is Dr. Carol Gunn, practicing physician in Portland, Oregon whose life and professional mission was changed drastically after the loss of her sister due to preventable medical errors. She's since then become an outspoken advocate for patient safety and has begun collecting other patient stories as well. She believes with strong health care, transparency, and accountability, the, the tide will turn on medical errors. How are you today, Dr. Gunn? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. When you say that your life and your professional mission changed after the loss of your of your sister, how did that come about? How did your sister's uh, death come about? So Anna uh, was a 59-year-old woman, and she had had a bone marrow transplant in 2013. And after the transplant, um, about um, seven or eight months after the transplant, she started having odd neurologic symptoms. And five months after that, she started having chest pain. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, her doctors didn't investigate why she might be having these chest pains and treated it first with antacids and then narcotics. And then she was even admitted to the hospital. They were still dealing with her neurologic symptoms, still having chest pains, and no one evaluated it. And then 12 days in, she had a heart attack and a few days after that. Mm -hmm. And her medical record um, actually clearly states that she died from having ongoing waves of heart attack. So. Wow. Um, because no one had been looking at her earlier um, complaints of chest pain, they missed a huge, huge, easy piece of information where she likely could still be alive today if someone had treated her. So you're, correctly. you're saying this was absolutely preventable. Absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of uh, checks and balances in place when it comes to, to someone with, uh, you say, a bone marrow transplant. With someone with a bone marrow transplant has an extensive medical uh, history and background. Um, are you saying that no one looked into her history to to say, well, maybe... Well, prior, well, prior to the transplant, they, she had a full cardiac workup and she was great. Mm -hmm. And she had been followed previously just for preventive care and had done well. So when she had this new symptom, it wasn't recognized that it was, you know, it wasn't really recognized as a new symptom or a new important syndrome symptom. And so um, she didn't have the basic care given when someone generally says, I've got chest pain, which includes, you know, a $50 EKG, um, kind of an evaluation of what might be causing the chest pain. So she started complaining about it to her doctors in February, and it wasn't until mid-May where she actually had a full evaluation. And by then, she'd already lost 50% of her heart's pumping power. She was, you know, just not able to make make up gains on that after she'd received a stent. It was just too much for her. You know, uh, every time you go to see a different doctor, you have to tell them your entire story over and over and over again, unless you, you know, you take your medical records with you and your x-rays and, and all these little discs if you've got to do that, how is it that you've got one person that's telling the same doctors, you know, not new doctors, doctors that have been seeing her? And right. are, is there no is there no communication well, whatsoever? I think there was some tunnel vision, you know. So I think initially, you know, she was particularly when she got to the hospital, she told them she had a two month history of chest pain. It's very clearly written in the note. Mm -hmm. And then the physician that was admitting her said, okay, we'll restart narcotics. And then the next team that saw her, say for the next, and pretty much the rest of her day in the hospital said, okay, we'll continue the narcotic without anyone saying, why would she be having chest pains like this? Mm -hmm. You know, the, there was a lack of curiosity, if you ask. Me. And she, there was, was no... Was she, yeah, by, was she by herself? Uh yeah, we had friends and family coming and going with her down there. And, um, uh, you know, I know she was admitted on, um, in a, in the, you know, early evening on a Sunday. And, um, her son was with her, her college age son. But I'm not sure why. I mean, I think they just, just thought because they looked at the old records and said, Oh, treated it with narcotics in the past. 
we're just going to keep treating it with narcotics. And so there was just a big colossal myth. Before your sister's passing, did you ever say or did something ever ring any type of bell, any type of red flag that, you know, one someone else who feels that uh, some type of mistake has been made? Uh, I mean, you don't want to you don't want to see one pill in a in a cup and then go all out and say, oh, you guys, you know, are incompetent. You don't want to do that. But what what are some of the things that a person should, should look for? And how do they start the conversation? You know, do you pull the doctor aside and say, hey, you know, this is what I think based on the fact that I'm not even a doctor? Yeah, I think you do start the conversation with the doctor and say, wow, that doesn't make sense to me. Can you tell me more about that? I mean, we did do that. I mean, I raised the question, why is she so short of breath? You know, why is this happening? We've got it under control. And so I probably could have been more persistent, too. I still can't explain. It's it's almost inexplicable to me why someone didn't fully evaluate that, particularly when I look at her medical records and how they describe why she was having. So with chest pains and heart issues, oftentimes you have shortness of breath, which she also had. And they would ascribe this shortness of breath to all these other issues, which didn't make much sense. So I think part of the problem was they were focused on her neurologic issues Mm -hmm. and then didn't realize, didn't realize the importance of the chest pain. And she knew it. I mean, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I will say after they recognized that was after she had had a heart attack in the hospital and needed a stent, you know, she and I were together um, the next morning in the room and she was mad because she knew how many times she had said it. And she actually thought they were you know, when you're in the hospital, you don't always know mm-hmm. what medications you're being given and why. And she thought they knew. And she realized then after the heart attack that they had not known. And mm. she was mad. She was yeah. livid. Oh, absolutely. And she asked me to go after it, you know. She asked me, are you going to go after it? And I said, yeah. do you want me to? And she's like, absolutely. No one should ever go through what I've been through. Now, as a as an advocate for strong healthcare leadership, including transparency, you, you speak on a lot of different subjects. Uh, when you were recently at the Oregon Patient Safety Commission uh, speaking with, with those leaders, when it comes to these electronic medical records, I mean, uh, we're talking about uh, when, when doctors are actually putting inputting their own notes as opposed mm-hmm. to someone else putting in the notes. Of, uh, yeah. Uh, acceptable- doctor. Oh, yeah. Acceptable use. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what, when it comes to um, doctors spending so much time inputting records as opposed to actually sitting down and talking with a patient. Um, maybe, you, as you said before, tunnel vision, they, they hear the same thing from the same patient and they just want to, they just want to get their notes done and turn that, that box off. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I also presented at um, a local hospital here in their medical grand rounds. And that was one of the comments from one of my own mentors. He said, Carol, we don't have time to sit down with the doctor or with the family anymore because we're we're spending so much time on the computer. It's like, but that's where we need to be. I mean, I, I don't know how to solve that without giving more time back to the providers, whether they're physicians, nurses, or whatever. You know, that is where we learn a lot of things, and as well as sitting with the family member because sometimes the family members have some pieces of information that. Um, the patient isn't able to describe themselves. And so without that kind of personal touch, we're going to lose this battle. Other than, than your sister's story and your own personal uh, loss, how do you get others interested in preventing medical errors, say those who don't encounter medical errors, or maybe um, a stitch pops and that's, the, that's all that they know about? How do you get people uh, on fire to prevent these medical errors that aren't the small stuff? Well, I think it's just like any other advocacy. It starts as a slow war, and then it has to get louder and louder. And with the number of errors that are being made, we know the estimates between 200 and 400,000 deaths per year. That's a huge number. We know that lots of people are touched by that. That's our third leading cause of death. 
And so if we can just start talking medical about it, errors we, are our third leading medical errors are our third leading cause of death. Yes. After can, after heart disease is one and number two is cancer and uh, medical errors would be our third. Uh, yes. So you're saying that simply the mistakes, the preventable mistakes made by physicians nationwide are killing us as fast or faster in some cases than cancer. It's, that's a certain types of cancers, right? So, uh, number one is cardiac reasons. Number mm-hmm. two is cancer. And number three, yes. Yes. Standard and it's standard. not just one study that's shown this. I mean, there have been multiple studies that have shown that there, um, the number is huge, just like this. So, um, I know there's been studies by, um, the surgeon, the office of the inspector general of the Department of Health and Human Services that shows that 15,000 Medicare patients die each month from uh, with a contribution from a medical error. So the numbers kind of all jive back to the 200 to 400,000 a year. Mm. It's outrageous. Outrageous, absolutely. Now, um, as we wrap up this segment, you do, you know, say that upon opening your sister's case and looking deeper into her situation, you, you came in contact with other people that were going through the same thing or had been through the same thing. And you've asked them uh, to, to give you their personal stories and uh, submit them via your website at www.carolgunmd.com. That's gun, G-U-N-N, carolgunmd.com. In addition to submitting their stories, what else will someone find when they go to your website? Um, they'll find Anna's story again. Um, they'll also find how to contact me. I'm just early on this journey. Anna only passed in May of 2014. And, it, you know, it, it's taken a while for me to get back on my feet even. And so it's so early in the journey, and I don't know where it's going to lead me, but I'm going to just keep waving the flag that we must do something differently. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. We've been in studio today talking with Dr. Carol Gunn, advocate for strong health care leadership, transparency, and accountability in the hopes of turning the tide on medical errors. Her website, www.carolgunmd.com. You can visit there. Uh, submit your story of a medical error or how you've um, identified and prevented a medical error before it turned into a significant uh, loss, uh, possibly loss of life. Uh, it's been great having you here with us again, Dr. Gunn. Thank you for having me. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm, and you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes.